All right, I want to get to the word this morning uh, out of Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. And the subject this morning is, I, I'm just calling it war. Yeah. Sometimes the, the enemy already declared war on us. We don't have to declare any war. He's already. Sometimes we don't fight back because we don't, we're not aware that we are on a war. But um, Luke chapter 4, I want to read just a short passage of a story. Uh, this is Jesus right after he got baptized by John. And you had uh, this uh, uh, amazing um, uh, experience. Um, uh, it says that if you read the, the, the verses before, um, no, the story before at Jesus' baptism, the Bible talks about how Jesus was baptized by John and, and, and the, the, the heavens were open and that the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus Christ and in the form of a dove and, and, and it says that, uh, that the God the Father spoke audibly so that the people who were there heard audibly, not just spiritually, the voice of God saying that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So it was such an, an, an amazing um, uh, experience for the people, such an amazing experience of, uh, uh, for Jesus, and it was like uh, the, one of the few times you see in the scripture where you see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost in action all at once, you know, and, and, and people got to experience this wonderful, um, uh, um, supernatural glory of God uh, among the people. So and then uh, Luke chapter 4 verse 1 starts with this, uh, just the, Jesus now full of the Holy Spirit left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. I mean, you go from this glory experience to a wilderness experience, and not just regular wilderness, it's a wilderness of temptation by the devil. And he ate nothing during those 40 days, and at the end of, on the end of them, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Satan always walks. Number four, and I, this, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I will. I, I don't like to do it, but I, I will, you know. Uh, if, the, 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 he comes in and just makes him, first of all, mocks him. Who do you think you are? And he mocks him because he knows that at this point, Jesus is at a point of weakness. He sees his vulnerability. He's been out in the wilderness eating nothing. Physically, he's probably starving. If he doesn't get anything to eat at this point, something's going to happen. And he sees his vulnerability, and he comes in and taunts him at the point of his weakness. And he taunts him with the thing that he would need the most. He says, he... Uh, who do you think you are? Are you really the son of God? Are you really who you claim to be? Look at you. For us, he mocks us at the places that he knows that we are weak. He says, how dare you go to church and lift your hands and say, God is good all the time, all the time, God is good. They don't even know what kind of person you are. Who do you think you are? Oh, and it keeps, go, keeps on going. Well, if you're truly the son of God, why don't you turn the bread? Why can't you help yourself, right? Verse 3 says, The devil said to him, If you're the son of God, I'm repeating it. Verse 4, Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. He had a spiritual perspective in life. Yeah, right there from the beginning, he says, Life is not, does not consist only of the five senses of the things that we can see, touch, feel, and all that. He says there is a lot more to life than the natural. He says, I live, yes, on the natural. I need to replenish my body. I need to eat. I need some food. But he says, that's not all I, I need for life. He says, that's important. But equally important, maybe even more important, is that man shall live also by the word of God. Because your spirit also needs enrichment. Your spirit also needs food and nutrition. And that comes from the word of God. If, you don't, if you're good physically, and you are bankrupt spiritually, it says, you're not living at all. 
Because life consists of both. And the spiritual part is even more important, he says. Jesus answered, so verse 5 says, The devil, he doesn't stop. Led him up to the high place and showed him, showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And then he said to him, I will give you all authority, and the, I will give you all the authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give you it. I, and I can give it to, to anyone I want to. If only you would worship me, I added the only, and it, it will be yours. You know what's interesting? And that passage goes on. I'm not going to stop there because I could keep reading down. The conversation goes on. Well, the one thing that is interesting to me is how relentless Satan is and also how audacious he is. Because he knows who Jesus is, but he keeps on daring. He knows only God should be worshipped. He knows Jesus is not going to fall into this, but guess what? He tries it. And how many times do we leave room for the enemy in areas that maybe we are even strong, but because he was relentless and he did not let up, we end up letting him win. It's like, this was not an issue for me. And all of a sudden, you find yourself just accepting things the way they are. Um, uh, at the beginning, I, I wouldn't say at the beginning, it's at the beginning of the year, but I know towards the last end of this quarter, I, I kept saying, in fact, my wife and I would have different conversations about this, and we'll be praying for our lives, we'll be praying for the church, uh, praying into the future, but I kept feeling like the enemy is attacking a lot. And it wasn't just us. And I talked to different, I've seen around the country sometimes, the enemy just unleashing on God's people. A lot of God, many, many of God's people just getting all sorts of spiritual attacks that go on. And you're like, man, that is not just regular uh, hardship. You know, there are times that life go, life has hardships. In fact, Jesus says, prepare for them. It's just the way it is. Because we live in a broken world. There are certain things that should be this way, but they are not. He says, so don't be discouraged when you go through the valleys. Don't be discouraged when you go through trials. Well, don't be discouraged because um, uh, this is part of what life is on this side. Take courage in knowing that I have overcome the world. So Jesus tells us that. But there are times that the enemy is as a, he was here with Jesus to our lives. He mocks. He points out things in our lives. He brings some crazy things in our family. Maybe if that would not work, he attacks your finances. He sends crazy people around your work to drive you nuts and get you to forget who you are. Oh, you know what I'm talking about, maybe. I don't want to know their names. But he, wanna mess, he wants to mess with your mind. He wants to get you distracted. He wants you to focus on all the right things. And we were talking about how it seems like it's a season where the enemy has been unleashing a lot. You know, you're praying for people, and then before you know you get another prayer request. I remember I got two prayer requests this week while I was praying for someone. <laughs> and I stood right there and says, I refuse these attacks in the name of Jesus. I'm not going to accept it. See, what, what he wants us to do is sometimes accept things. No, that's the way it's going to be. We need the spiritual discernment. To know that there are times where you just have to stop and say, Satan, get thee behind me. That's what I didn't read. Because he went on and talked about the kingdoms. He went on and mocked God and said, at one point Jesus says, I am done. It, enough is enough. Get thee behind me, Satan. I'm not going to accept this. What's interesting is that sometimes... He likes to pull us down after we've had great experiences, great um, um, wins, things are going well. I've seen this over and over again as I've served the Lord. Oftentimes people that step out and they try to, have, uh, to push their lives through, maybe to get into a deeper relationship with God. I've seen people get attacked after giving a testimony. Attacked after they decided to get baptized, they're excited about God. They go maybe filled with the Holy Ghost, and, and then that week is the week things happen. Amen. Let me give you another scale. Oh man, I haven't been 
Maybe you're even here today and you thought, you, you're like, ah, I need to go to church. I need to get my life with God. I need to spend time with God. And then something happens. You don't go. But some of you push through. If you came here today, not to embarrass you or anything, but I want to, if you came here today but you had to push through to make it, raise your hand. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. You just won one single battle sometimes. I remember a story. It said of this guy uh, 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 that uh, stood at the temple. In his, it's in Acts chapter uh, three. This guy had been a beggar. He'd been uh, because he was he was, um, he, was uh, he could not walk, and he and he, he stood at the gate of the temple in the in the in the book of Acts and, and asked for people to help him just to, to to eat and to be able to have a life. And he had st- sat there for so long, for so long. But this one day, there were a few guys in town coming, and it was Peter and his buddies came out, and this guy's asking for money. Could you help me out? You know, I'm down here. And Peter looks at him and says, I got, I got nothing here, but I do have something that you need. And he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Yes. And that moment changed his life. That moment, God did a miracle. That moment, his life was changed forever. His destiny was changed forever. And, and, and he, he no longer, we didn't, we didn't read much about his life after that, but I, I, I bet you anything, he probably wasn't begging anymore because he got more than just food for the day. God gave him enough strength to do even more. Sometimes Satan keeps us from the presence of God. He keeps us from the things of God. I mean, like simple things sometimes. And we miss out on the day of our visitation. And we miss out on the day of our miracle. I bet you anything that guy did not go to the temple gates that morning thinking, today I'm going to be walking home. In fact, he says he didn't walk home. If you read the rest of the story, it says he went walking and leaping and praising God. I used to, I mean, sang that in Sunday school. Proking and leaping and praising God. Is that just my Sunday school teacher that did that? And I love that part. But anyway, he didn't know that. You don't know what God might do today. But what we are called to do is to always have a heart of expectation, knowing that anything with God is possible. You might have had a hardship, or maybe you're going through a hardship in your life that you cannot see your way through. But I tell you, God is able to turn it around in a moment's notice. I want to be in his presence. I want to be with his people. I want to be in worship. I want to be at the places so I do not miss my hour of visitation. Okay, going back to my point (laughs) is that there are times in our lives that we are going through things and it's not because it's just natural. There are things that sometimes we suffer or even go through hardship that it's an assault, a direct intentional assault from the father of all lives, from the pit of hell. And we as God's people need to be aware of that and pray differently about those times. Recognizing, I feel like it's been a season of attacks. And maybe I could get a witness. If you feel like there's been attacks, maybe in your family, your life, around people you know, raise your hand. Look around. See, a lot of people are feeling it. Because it started when we, it was around October. With, when I would say, man, I feel like there's some kind of spiritual heaviness and an attack coming on people. And it's not our church only. I think it's because of what God's doing on the earth. There is a revival that's about to happen. The Bible says that in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Amen. This is a, I, I believe that we are in those times where God is doing something and there is an agitation happening on the spiritual. You know, Satan recognized what Jesus was about to do. See, Jesus got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He, he, his ministry gets launched off. He spends 40 days with God, fasting and praying, and he's ready to come in and do his ministry. What did Satan wants to do? Disrupt it before it even got started. So he comes in because Jesus was not, he was the son of God, but he was also the son of man. He was deity, he has relationship with God, he is God, but he lived in the flesh, his human body. So the things, he was hungry, 
He had the same problems that we did. Um, if someone managed to kill him prematurely, he would have died. When he was born, the king at the time wanted to kill him. His father escaped to Egypt and uh, had him until he came back. So he, if he did not take care of himself, I mean, they would have just suffered the same thing. Satan wanted to put an end before the beginning. And it wasn't so much after Jesus. It was after what Jesus was about to do because Jesus did not come for himself. He did not need anything. He came for you and for me. He came, he said, he came so that we can be free. He was wounded that we may be um, uh, healed. He went on the cross that we may have life. He had to fulfill his purpose. Satan attacks because he's afraid of what God is doing. And we as the people of God, we need to open our spiritual understanding and not fight every battle naturally. We need to look at it and sometimes and say we put an end. We recognize that we are, t- we are at a time of spiritual warfare and we need to engage in spiritual battles. We cannot win spiritually when we fight people in the natural. Sometimes people are not our problem. Now, I get it. There's some people that are really annoying to be around. There's some people that can push you. They can push the wrong buttons in you. But let's just get some perspective and recognize that it's, we don't fight against flesh and blood enemies. It allows you, if anything, to be able to be bigger than it. Because if you stoop down to their level, you just look like, just like them. But when you look at it spiritually, you're able to see it from a vantage point. And the person that was your enemy that drives you nuts, all of a sudden, you have compassion for them and you're praying for them. Yeah. They don't even know it, but you're praying for them. You decided to take your battle off of the natural to the spiritual how do we overcome, and I want to talk to just maybe as it relates to prayer, because sometimes I find that uh, the way we don't win certain battles that we are engaging in, sometimes we are not praying right because we have a wrong mentality, and sometimes we, don't even, we are not even aware that we're being attacked. First thing, actually, you open your eyes to recognize that there is a battle, there is a war going on, and it's spiritual. How do I pray then with that regard to be able to stand and, and, and win um, uh, these spiritual attacks that are waged against us. And they manifest themselves in very different ways. The first thing is that you have to do, and it has to do with our mind, is knowing who we are, who, what our identity is. Getting your mind together about your identity. See, the thing that Satan attacked Jesus on the first, he attacked, he questioned, he says, are you, are you really the son of God? No, he didn't say that. I, uh, if you're really the son of God. The first area, and if he can win this, he's got you. Is when he starts messing up with your identity. And you start buying into the lies that have been spoken about you. There are lies that sometimes have been spoken about us that we have come to accept as they are. Because the lies began a long time ago, even before we understood anything. There are some lies just have to do with things that people... In your, maybe you grew up in a family that was messed up. A lot of people do. And things were said about you. That you somewhat don't believe it, but inside you've kind of almost believed that you are good for nothing or while well, you're... Just like that, you're not going to do it. And, 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 and we begin to internalize those thoughts. And they have an impact in who we become. They have an impact in how we conduct our lives. They have an impact on how we react through um, when we have difficulties. All of us will experience difficulties. If you haven't already, just keep on living. I trust me, you will. But how we, re- we either react or respond to them is largely dependent on how we see ourselves. And oftentimes, little things that are just planted. Oh, you are ugly. Mm. 
you're weak. You'll never amount to anything. You're dumb. You can never and you can fill in the blanks. And how many times I says, oh, I can never do that. Oh, I can't. But the Bible says when we come to Christ, he changes our identity. I mean, you might be, who, not you might be, you are who you are because of where you came from. But in Christ, he cuts it off and he gives us a new identity. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 1, check this out. Verse 3 says, Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy, blameless in his sight. In love, he, held, he predestined us for adoption into sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. What is he saying here? That your identity is not dependent on you. It's not dependent on your performance. It's not dependent on what you decide is. It says God in love in his good pleasure has adapted you into his family. He's the one who chose us to become his own. He's the one who chose you to even know him. He says that we love him, the Bible says, because he first loved us. And he has called us into sonship. He has called us into uh, the identity, to identify with his family, that we are his sons and his daughters. We say that in church all the time. But you got to let that sink in and become true to the way you see yourself. I'm not just, I used to be solo that kid. But when I got saved, when Jesus, when I gave my life to the Lord, when he changed my life, he made me his own. And now my past no longer defines me. My ancestors no longer define me. My father no longer define me. The people around me no longer define me. What society says about me no longer defines me because I know I am a child of God. My father owns it all. I'm adopted in the right family and the best family that could ever be. God is not just my God. God is my God and he is my father. Yes. Amen. Amen. So that's a, it's, a, it's a mentality. And so it changes how you pray and how you see things. And it changes when you know that Satan is trying to assault you. He's trying to attack you. He's trying to bring some discouragement and some fear in your life. You can look at him and say, you don't know who you're messing with. This is a daughter of God. This is a son of God you're messing with. And I'm not going to take your baggage. I am a child of God. I've noticed... Sonship or daughtership is something really powerful when you know who you are. Some of the people that don't, I, I look at my toddlers. They're amazing people. Very little, they don't know anything in this world. But when they are around their father or their mother, I mean, they have no boundaries. I could be so busy. I'm like, I'm doing great work right here. My two-year-old does not respect that. I'm like, I gotta be working here. No, they'll climb on my back when I'm working. I, I mean, the other day, <clears throat> I got a phone call, and it was an important phone call I needed to take. And I decided, okay, I'm gonna go down to my office. I'm gonna make sure kids are ca down and everything. And I'm like, I got on the phone, and it's an important phone call. And before I know it, that's the time that someone climbs on your back. Somehow they manage the way to open the door. They, they have no respect for that. It's like, you're my dad. You belong to me. You're mine. I don't care who's on the other phone. I don't know how important they are. <coughs> how many can identify? I've had a home office for a while. 
But, but there's something about the little child that doesn't see, that, 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 that sees who they are. They don't even know. They don't have any trouble. Life is so easy. When they cry, I was like, man, life is so hard. You don't even know it. <laughs> but, but life is so easy for them. They have nothing to worry about because they feel safety. They feel security in their identity. They feel security in who they belong to. God wants us to start treating him like our two-year-old treat us. In that, we know that when he saved us, when he called us his own, he called us his own. And so when we are praying about certain things, where you're feeling certain things that are coming up against you, you don't have to be timid in the way you pray. The Bible says that we should approach the throne of grace with confidence. We should approach the throne of grace with confidence. And so um, uh, I should turn off that thing anyway. Did you guys hear that? Thank you, Jesus. And I just told myself, I had my volume up. But um, <clears throat> uh, the first thing that he, I, Satan attacks, he attacks, and it's amazing how he wins this one. It just gets us enough to question who we are. And so we don't pray confidently. We beg. When God says, no, I want you to go take it. I want you to stand up. Second thing is that, which kind of leads to what I began, is that when we are comfortable in who we are and we understand our identity and our placement in Christ, then we need to start praying with power and authority. Ephesians 3.10 says, His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. Um, God wants to show off through us. Did you hear what I, what I said? God wants to show off through us. <coughs> now a bunch of you parents, you take your kids to basketball or football. I mean, the whole team is playing, Right? Everyone is pulling in their effort. But what do you see on Facebook, on Instagram? My little junior is the one making this team. He made a shot. He only made one shot, but I tell you, it's celebrated like crazy, right? We love when our kids do great. We love when our kids exceed our expectation. We love to see our kids do well and succeed when they put their minds to something. We love to see that God wants to, God enjoys this. That's my boy. That's my girl right there. You thought you could take him down, but he says, no, 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 no. He is strong. He's not taking it. And look at him. He get through it. He was hit by, by some health issues, and, but that did not keep him down. He just kept going back and says, you know what? I might not be feeling good right now, but, but, but I'm still walking. I'm still standing. You hit him with some financial things in their lives, and, uh, and, and you thought you are going to put him down. No, but they're keeping their attitude good. They, they have a positive attitude. They're deciding that they're not going to go in and start a pity party and they're going to just continue to say, you know what? I might be broke right now, but I'm still blessed. I'm still blessed. I know that this does not define my future. They're keeping a good mentality. They don't know what's going on around them, but they're not losing it. They're not losing it when everybody else is freaking out about what's going on. They're just a peace that passes all understanding. They are so comfortable in knowing that God is good, that he causes all things to work together for the good. Oh, it might be crazy, but somehow, some way, I know my God will turn even the difficult things that are going on in my life, and somehow in his way, he's going to make it for my good. And I'm all right. He's going to make it for my good. I promise you, what was meant to, to, to destroy me will bless me. What was meant to curse me will bless me. What was meant to bring me down one day will be the testimony. The test that I see today will be my testimony tomorrow. I know that God will turn things around at his right time. So you pray with authority. You know who you are. And you're like, yep, I, I get it. We get it. We've been hit. I felt like we started this year just fighting small things. I mean, great things are happening on one side, and then on the other side, you hear like just little battles that are distraction. They take your time. You're like, I, I had all this week planned this way, and then I knock my back down, and I can't do anything I planned. This is all right. Nice one, nice one. But I'm going to be praying anyway. I'm going to be getting other things done that cannot be done 
otherwise, it's like, so it's time for war, and we are not intimidated. My last point for today, refuse to, get, to be bullied. Yes. Refuse to be bullied. Nothing stops a bully. The bully only stops when they get themselves a punch back. How many love the Christmas story? One of the favorite movies of all times. How many just feel very satisfied when the bully gets? You're like, yeah, you shouldn't be responding violence, Junior. You know, we got to help our emotions here. But man, when that bully gets their nose bleeding, you're like, you feel some sense of satisfaction. <laughs> okay, that's all right. Poor thing, you know. Well, Satan is a bully. And sometimes he needs to be punched back. Uh. I tell you, when he gets punched back, <laughs> he's like, God, he's intimidated you all your life. He's brought the worst out of you all the time. He causes you to walk in fear and intimidation. He makes you doubt who you are, question your identity, wondering if you're really going to make it, wondering if you're lying to yourself, deciding sometimes to just get yourself, have pity on yourself. At times, you have to say, Satan is enough. I'm not going to take it anymore. You keep on trying. I'm going to punch back. You punch. I'm going to do a double punch back. You try two. I'm going to do three. Yes. Because I will not take it anymore because I know who my father is and I'm not backing down. I refuse to be bullied by you. The Bible says that our family is blessed because of the Lord. It says that the blessings of the Lord are upon me. That the blessings of the Lord makes us rich. It has no sorrow with it. That he says that he will bless us in the city and in the country. Everywhere we go, we're blessed. He says even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we are not going to be afraid because I know that God is with me. And it's a calling out the, prayer, the promises of God in prayer. He says, yeah, try it again, try it again, but I'm not backing down. Jesus got to that point. Satan just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And he says, Satan, get thee behind me. Yes. Right. The Bible says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Yes. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You gotta refuse to be bullied. Of course, there's an order in the way that happens. Are you submitted to God? If you're submitted to God, then you can resist and He will flee. If you're not submitted to God, you'll resist. And I was like, ha 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 ha. But we're devoted. We know who we are. We spend our time with God. We walk in the power and the authority of Jesus' name, and we speak the word of God of our, of our situation. You might have, maybe, I don't know why I'm dealing with finances. Maybe your attacks on, is on the finances on one side. Well, it might not be looking good, but God... Our God is able. Start speaking scriptures. Make adjustments in your life that you need to make in accordance with the will of God. Ephesians chapter 6, I want to read this passage. It talks about the armor of God. It says, finally, verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to take your stand against the devil's schemes. For the struggles that we have, they are not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against all the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms or in the spiritual realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that you, when the day of evil comes, that's really telling, it's not if the day of evil comes, when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground. You'll be able to refuse to be bullied. And after you have done all these things, you will be able to stand. Stand firm then with a belt of truth buckled around your waist with a breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. You know, uh, Paul describes a spiritual warfare to us, um, um, and, 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 and in the... In, in, and I'm not going to go into the details of, of all this, but uh, the point is, is that we can stand. 
we can stand our ground. With the Lord's help, we can stand our ground. And God's given us all the spiritual blessings we need to stand our ground and say, yep, I know what you're doing. I'm not ignorant of the, of the attacks that come from the outside, and I'm not intimidated. You punch me, I'll punch you too back. And the Bible teaches us these principles in everything. Okay? It says, God always does the opposite. I need something. God created the principle of the seed from the very beginning, first chapter of the Bible. He says when he puts life in something, he puts a seed. And in the seed, there's potential for more. Okay? A farmer goes, grows his crop, takes the crop, needs food. But what happens if the farmer eats all his harvest? The farmer's going to starve next year, right? What does the farmer do? They take the fast, they set the seed aside. I know I need food. He says, sow it to the ground. I need food next year. I want food security for my kids and my family next year. Plant what you already have. Sow it into your future. And by the grace of God, with the right condition, with hard work and diligence, when the time of harvest come, I'm going to have way more than I planted in the, in the ground. When you're discouraged, you're feeling alone, Satan wants you to come and look in the mirror and feel sorry for yourself. God says, you feel alone, you be a blessing to someone. Look for someone else that's feeling lonely and be just an encourage them to them. So a seed. Stop thinking, you're feeling sorry about yourself. You're broke, he says, so a seed. Plant, bless somebody else. I need this. I bless someone with what I need. And you see the principles of the kingdom working. I could tell, sit down and give you stories, not just for myself, because the stories of people in here too. They needed something, but some, they, and then God presents an opportunity for you to be a blessing to someone else with something that you need. So Satan attacks you, he says, oh great. You think you're going to intimidate it by me? I'll tell you what. I'm not intimidated at all. I'm taking all I have and I'm giving it to someone else who needs it. And I'm going to be a blessing to them. That's how you punch back. You punch back. I need prayer in my life. I need healing in my life. I'm going to look for somebody else that needs healing. I'm going to be praying for them. What Satan wants to do is like, how can you pray for somebody when you yourself need it? He wants us to start be self-centered. See, when Jesus was coming out of the wilderness, the story we read at the beginning, what did Satan do the first thing? He says, feed yourself. If you're the child of God, why don't you feed yourself? Get some bread. Turn the stones into bread. And I want Jesus to take the focus off of what he came to do because Jesus did not come to, to for himself. He came for the world. And he's just prepared himself in the ministry and he's getting ready to come and reveal himself to the world. But Satan wants him to start thinking about his own needs to be the center of attention. Jesus says, no, you, you, I'm not getting distracted by this. That's what he does every single time. Says that's why you with the scriptures that says, Let the poor say that I am rich. Let the weak say that I am give it the opposite. Yes. To receive you give. You can never outgive God. We punch back that way. We pray with authority. We know our identity. We know who we are. We don't pray intimidated kind of prayers. We pray with authority because we know what God has promised. Take the word of God and speak it back. Speak it back. Pray it back. Pray the word over your children. Pray your word over your finance. Pray the word and pray it back. But you punch back by doing the opposite of what your natural mechanism would be. Oh, I'm hungry right now. It's like, no. I'm going to give somebody else. There's someone that's hungrier than me, and I'm taking what I have and going to sow into someone else. Sow into your future. Sow into where you want to go. Do the opposite. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And God's principles of the kingdom, they work every single time.
time. It's God's grace that brings rain. It's God's grace that brings the good season. But we have to sow. That's our job. We have to cultivate. That's our job. We have to, to work hard. We have to go to the field. That's our job. But with God's grace, he takes that one seed and he multiplies over and over again. Don't eat your seed, sow your seed. And that's why you hit back and says, I refuse to be bullied. You think, you think, yeah, I'm closing with one story and we're going to pray. And it had to do with finances. I don't know why I tell about this season of our life so much. It's only about a year and a half of time. But we were tested with our finances, Sarah and I. Um, since the, when we were married, we always did great with our money and all that. And we always uh, give us and we are always, we would see God just do uh, um, miracles. But this season was tough. We started a business, and, and the second year, things got really tough. And in that season, I remember that one of the years we were talking, we were only just maybe giving our tithe. We always give way more than our tithe. And at that year, we found that we just give. We looked at our statements. Like, you know what we did? We were making very little, and all we did is tithe. And we weren't sowing generously. But we didn't have a lot to sow generously. And we praise this God, you know, you've given us a lot. What can we sow? And we started looking at things in our house uh, and things that we have, possessions that we have, so that we can give. We had two cars. We thought, oh, we don't really need to. We get away with one. Found someone that needed another car. We gave him that extra car. We found, we look at things like that and we just sold. Because what we wanted for us is not because we were going through a hard time. We didn't want to get into a place where our heart of generosity is limited because our resources have been limited. Because when we started looking deeper, we wanted to keep that heart of generosity going on and releasing things and sowing things, you know. And I'm not saying that that one particular event triggered anything, but it did something for our spirit. So we were not hanging on to things and keeping that forefront. And God turned things around and the business started doing well. And God said, you know, and think, but that, that one year we looked back and said, man, we didn't really give that much. And we, it was always our, our the, since our marriage, we started before we were married, but even as we are married, we always give way over and above. But that year we looked at it and we look, only we, we did just what the law says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse, and that's not who we are. We saw more. I say that story because sometimes Satan wants to intimidate us when we know, when he knows there's a hardship in our life, and so we start being just self-focused. God says, no, I got you. I got your back. Don't worry. And even that season, he will turn it around for your good. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand?